coordination dynamic. We may have a failure to coordinate. So this is you go to Penn Station, I go to Grand Central Station, or you go to the ballet and I go to boxing, or we both, we both swerve or neither of us swerve, right? This is a failure of coordination that we potentially face. We can imagine there are situations in which, and this is actually less true today than it was even 10 years ago. It used to be the case that it was actually quite difficult when you took your phone from country to country to use, your, use the same phone in different places. You had to have an, not just a different SIM card, you had to have a different phone in different jurisdictions. Why? Because there were multiple standards. That's a failure of coordination. It didn't make sense not to have a single standard and we eventually got there. Third risk or third potential uh, coordination failure is suboptimal coordination. So the best way to think about this is that if we go back to the back to the meeting place game, I told you that we could meet at either Grand Central or Penn Station, right? And the payoff for each of those was five for each of us. But what if we were right near Penn Station and very far from Grand Central Station? Now it's much better to coordinate at Grand Central Station because we're right there. We just walk in the building and we find each other. As opposed to we both go all the way uptown to get to, to get downtown to get to Penn Station, right? Um, in that situation, there is this real potential that we coordinate around the wrong standard. We coordinate along the, along the, uh, around the wrong result. Two examples of this that are very commonly given. Uh, one is our keyboard. So if any of you have a keyboard out or even your phone, you know, the keyboard we use is called the QWERTY keyboard. The QWERTY keyboard for the letters in the upper left, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. There was developed about 60, 70 years ago something called the Dvorak keyboard, the Dvorak keyboard, which was a keyboard that it was much more efficient. For the English language, it was much easier to type and much quicker to type with the Dvorak keyboard. But the problem was, by the time the Dvorak keyboard was introduced, everyone already knew the QWERTY keyboard. All the typewriters were structured on the QWERTY keyboard. And as a result, even though it was widely acknowledged that Dvorak was a better keyboard, it didn't take hold. Similar story with, now all of this is dated, so it's only for us old folks in the front. The, uh, uh, we used to have these things, VHS tapes, that we would watch movies and things on. There were, there was, VHS was the one that was dominant, but there had been another one called Betamax that was a smaller tape, shorter, but much better quality. But because VHS got to market literally a year earlier than Betamax, Betamax was never able to take hold. And as a result, VHS became the dominant standard. So these are all suboptimal coordination. Finally, lock-in. The idea is that once a given, uh, a given technology is in place, it may be very hard to change that technology to displace that technology. Now, if there are the possi these possibilities of coordination failure, why haven't we talked about the role of law, the role of regulation in solving them? And I want to suggest that there's sort of, uh, let me put all this up and then I'll just say it very briefly. The, uh, that there are two reasons why we, uh, we ignore, we have wrongly ignored the role of law in these, in these coordination settings. The first is some notion that it'll take care of itself. The notion is that if it's better for us to meet at Penn Station, or it's better for us to go to the ballet, or it's better to use one keyboard versus another, it'll, it'll solve itself, right? It'll take care of itself. So one is the notion that these things just work out. We don't need law, we don't need regulation to intervene to do anything because it'll fix itself. And then a related notion is that communication will solve the problem. Communication will solve the problem, right? If we could all talk effectively, we could say, okay, this is what we're going to do and then we coordinate. But that's wrong for two reasons or problematic for two reasons. One is that if there's not two of us, but a hundred of us or a thousand of us or 10 million of us, it becomes much harder to talk, right? Communication becomes much more difficult. And as a result, we may not be able to communicate. But the bigger problem is that our incentive in these coordination games is not necessarily to tell the truth. So I'm gonna go back for a second to the meeting place game. No, I'm sorry, to the battle of the sexes game. So Thomas Schelling that I mentioned earlier, he said that um, uh, if the wife in the battle of the sexes uh, wants to ensure that they're going to go to the boxing match, what should she do? Schelling said she should on the phone tell her husband, I'm going to the boxing match and that's the end of it. Hang up the phone and rip the cord out of the wall. Now you don't even know what a cord is, all you young folks. Used to be the phone went in the wall. So anyway, you pull the cord out of the wall, take out the battery, whatever. The, um, so, uh, so he said that's what she should do. Because if she does that, where will the husband go? The boxing match, right? 
if, if she says, I'm going to the boxing match, I don't care. Now, again, I don't recommend this to anyone. He um, <laughs> says, I'm going to go there. With these payoffs, he'll go there as well. The same story is true with any standard setting. If you say to me, um, you have your standard, I have mine, um, and I will never switch to your standard, right? I should then switch to yours, right? Because we benefit from being on the same standard, all right? But I have the intent to say the same thing. I will never switch to your standard, right? And therefore, communication is not necessarily effective. All right, so, so it turns out that, contrary to these assumptions, it's not the case that, um, that uh, communication will solve the problem. So the last thing I want to do is I want to take a few minutes to, um, to basically talk through what some of the implications of this are. So if we want to talk about, again, how game theory might be applied here, what does the use of game, what is using game theory, using this, this theory of coordination games, do for us in thinking about the role of law, the role of regulation, the design of law and regulation in these different areas? So first one, let me, let me skip over this. The um, first one, traditionally we think of law and regulation as characterized by coercive power. What makes something law is the force of law, the force of the state, the threat of force that stands behind it. But it turns out, if the goal is to coordinate expectations, the way in which we go about doing that is not necessarily, or need not necessarily be coercive. Where the government issues a white paper, or convenes a conference, or releases information, or sponsors research, or makes its own purchasing decisions, it may impact the behavior of individual parties, individual companies, just as much as if they had required it. If the dynamic is one of coordination, the government can have an impact without doing anything that is coercive in nature. Simply by increasing the visibility, the salience is the word we use, the salience or visibility of a particular result, a particular outcome, it may have that impact. So here I give the example of, if the government were to say, let's take computers. So Apple computers are still much less popular than PCs. If the US government, or the government of India, or the US government and the government of India were to say, from now on, we will only purchase Apple computers. Although they're not telling anyone else they must buy an Apple computer, you can be assured that the consumption of Apple computers by non-government entities will explode. Why? Because they are calling attention to this alternative coordination equilibrium that can be used, okay? Now, to give you a sense of how that works in practice, again, so we've been talking a long time, so for our sort of our, our, our exercise for the morning, the, uh, I want to do a couple of coordination games with you. So this one was Thomas Schelling himself, actually all of these are Thomas Schelling's uh, ones that Thomas Schelling himself developed. He showed his students who were graduate students in economics at, uh, New ha at Yale University in New Haven. He put this picture in front of them and he told them X and Y are two paratroopers. You know paratroopers, uh, soldiers who jump from the airplane. The, uh, so they have landed at location X, Y. You're one of them. You have this map, right? Uh, and you have to find each other and you have no way to communicate. Where will you find each other? Where? Where do you say? Banks of the river. Anywhere in particular though? Where? To the... To the pond. Okay, you said the pond. Okay. What others think? The bridge. How many thought the bridge? All right. So most most of the bridge, but you have a mix of things. The bridge is the one that's most commonly given. Why would that be? Why the bridge versus the banks of the river generally, or the something else? It's connecting the two parts. It's right in the middle. There's only one of them, right? So if I'm trying to figure out what will you expect me to do. The bridge makes sense as a place that we might go. Okay, now, now that was your that was the easy one. Now then, now for we get a harder one. Next one, I want you to look at these boxes here. So you see, there's 16 red boxes there. I want you in your mind to put a check in one of those boxes. And if you all put the check in the same box, if you all put the check in the same box, then you each get a hundred dollars. You're not going to get a hundred dollars. The dean can't afford that. The um, so in that you'll get an imaginary. You'll get my love and affection, which is worth a hundred dollars. The um, so if you all put a check in the same box, you get a hundred dollars. Now again, remember what you're doing. You're trying to coordinate. You're trying to think. Where will everybody else expect me to put the check? Okay. All right. Who wants to tell us? Yep. Left side. So bottom left. What do you say? 
No, you can't do it. Okay, very good. good I, very creative, but you lose. The, uh, somebody else had their hand up here? Yeah. What's the first one? Left top. Okay. So you said left bottom. You said left top. How many said left top? How many said left bottom? No, 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 come on. You have to, you can't, there's no abstention. What did all of you say? You're too distinguished to choose? The, uh, okay. The, uh, all right. So the, uh, so most people choose the upper left box. Why would that be? Why most natural, though? What is it key to? It's writing, writing and reading, right? So when I do this in China, which box do they choose? Right? And often, depending on the place, right bottom. Because sometimes they write from bottom to top, right? In an Arabic-speaking country, clearly top right, because they always write top down, right? So you can see how culture may impact what is salient, what's visible, what stands out. And if government can shape by regulation what stands out, they may have that impact. Next one. Choose one of the numbers listed below. Choose one of the numbers listed below, okay? If you all pick the same number, again, you get $100. You all pick the same number. So you're trying to figure out again, what do I expect others will pick? Which number do I think others will pick? You had a chance, wait. The, uh, what number do I think others will pick? Go ahead, one second, yeah. A hundred, okay, how many said a hundred? Oh good, a lot said a hundred, good, what else? What other? 261, why 261? But what about 13 is in the center too then? Okay, yeah, but again, you can imagine if there was, if it was in the center. Oh, I see, because they're additional numbers. Good, I like that. Okay, any others? No, why 99? Good, two nines. Looks very Okay, it's interesting. Any other ones? Triple five. Good, why triple five? Good, all right, biggest number. Good, and it's the same number three. Interesting, nobody said the number that's most commonly picked. Seven, Why? and why would seven? Luckiest. Just oh seven's lucky. Okay, but it's also just the first number, right? Okay, but again, you get the idea of thing. Last one. The um, I want you to think of some positive number. Now again, this is an interdisciplinary conference, so you all should know at least a little bit of math. But lest you don't, everyone should know what a positive number is. It means not a negative number. It's a whole number. So you know two twenty eight whatever. It's not a negative number, and it's not zero. You think of a, think of a, a positive number. If you all think of the same number, then then you get your hundred dollars. Anyone? Seven. Is seven like a lucky number in India generally? It is? Okay, so you could say seven. No, or not for you. All right, anyone have other ideas? One. How many said one? Oh, not many. Okay, that's it. So one is usually the most common. Why would one be? It's the first one. So it's the lowest positive number. And once you go past one, then two, seven, I, you know, you don't, doesn't like seven. The, uh, all of those numbers become possibilities. All right. So that's the idea of, of the way in which the government might regulate then in these settings is by shaping salience, by increasing the visibility of a given number. That's a very different notion of how the government might regulate. Very briefly, let me go through just a couple of others and then we'll wrap up because we're running behind. The um, information is regulation. So playing off of those last, those last slides, if in fact the role of regulation is to shape expectations, to coordinate expectations, then it turns out when the government issues information, when the government mandates disclosure, when the government issues a white paper, when the government convenes a conference, in some ways they are regulating just as much as if they issued a rule or passed a new law. Okay? So we have to think differently about what the government is doing in terms of how it accomplishes this thing, and information production may be an important regulatory function. Uh, again, I, I'm glad to get you these slides so you can, if you others have more, one more detail. But I just want to note them briefly. Second, third one, um, public role in standard setting. So traditionally, when we thought about standard setting, we think of either the government sets the standard, which is called de jure standard setting by law. The government says everyone must do this. Or alternatively, they leave it to the market. De facto, the market just does it spontaneously. Or committee or group standard setting where everyone in a given industry, in the wireless industry or the oil and gas industry, comes together and they agree on a common standard. But it turns out that if, if we have a coordination dynamic, the government may play a role not in setting the standard, but in encouraging parties to set the standard. So remember HGTV. I told you there were three competing standards. For 20 years, there was no agreement. How did that ultimately get resolved? You might imagine that a government said, you must use this standard. That's not what happened. Instead, 
what's called the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC in the United States, convened a conference. They convened a conference. It was called the Grand Alliance Conference that they brought together the private and public entities involved in the HDTV industry from all three jurisdictions. It was a week-long conference. You can imagine it was almost like prison. They made all these people, they trapped them in a ballroom in Washington, D.C., and said, you cannot leave here for one week. And lo and behold, at the end of that week, what happened? They agreed on a common standard. The government didn't dictate the standard, but it did coordinate or facilitate that standard set. Again, another way in which this coordination framework might change how we think about regulation. I mentioned innovation earlier, very briefly on innovation. You might think about innovation in some sense as involving exactly the opposite problem from the problem that we have in the prisoner's dilemma. So remember, the prisoner's dilemma settings, environmental law, securities law, workplace safety, so on and so forth. There, we are trying to reduce the amount of defection. We want less defection. By contrast, with innovation, what do we want? More defection. We are actually trying to encourage defection. We want more people to say, everyone is coordinating around this. How do we change that? Go back to my example of the government saying, we will only buy Apple computers. What are they doing? They're, in essence, encouraging innovation. Why? Because they're saying, we are not beholden to the dominant coordination equilibrium or result. We are willing to deviate from it. And therefore, the incentive of a company to innovate, of an individual to innovate, increases significantly. How does the government do that? Financing basic research, encouraging linkages among, among entities, facilitating communication, and so on and so forth. Last two sort of implications, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. The, um, um, if in fact, things like, well, let me, say, let me say it a different way. Traditionally, when we think about the government action, the government regulation, the government conduct that is subject to review, we generally think of, we can review what the government does when the government tells you you must do something or tells you you cannot do something, okay? So where the government is coercing you, that's when you can go to court and say, I challenge what the government does. If all the government does is gives you advice or makes a suggestion or generates information, the general position in most countries is you can't challenge it. All the government is doing is they're just, you know, they're participating in the market, they're generating information. When I was a lawyer for the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., for the United States in, in Washington, D.C., I had a case that involved a man who was a farmer uh, in Nebraska, no, South Dakota, uh, but he was also a part-time employee of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And in the little area, the district in which he farmed, there was a meeting. Um, it was a meeting convened by some other group or some other organization about irrigation techniques. Irrigation techniques. And so he stood up and he said, I think that this technique is better than this other technique. And so the company that developed the other, that sold the other technology, the, early, the other technology that he said he didn't like, sued the U.S. government. And I was the lawyer to defend it. And he said, he did this and he didn't go through the proper procedures for issuing a regulation. Now, this was a silly case. I got it dismissed immediately because I went in front of the judge and I said, don't be ridiculous.